my goal for today is to teach you guys a little bit about how self-driving cars work. And we're going to start with this. So first question for today, because I need to test your prerequisite knowledge to make sure we're ready to move on to self-driving cars. What is this? It's, it's, it's pattern, yeah. Does anyone know what comes after that bottom yellow square? A, a red square? Are you sure? How sure are you? Does anyone second that it will be a red square? Yeah, kind of, kind of. Oh, okay, you guys, you guys need to raise your hand, but whatever. It is a red square. How did you know that? I don't know if you guys want to share, but I think you know that because you recognize the pattern. Now, what else recognizes patterns? AI. AI actually does pattern recognition very well. In fact, it's what it's best at. That's kind of the whole purpose. And that's how we birth things like behavioral cloning. So essentially, what AI does is it takes data, it figures out the patterns in that data, and then regurgitates it as a prediction. And when you convert this prediction into an action, that's how you get behavioral cloning. Essentially, what that means is an AI can watch a human behavior and then replicate it itself. So when applied to driving, the data that you would input would be a picture of what the car sees on the road, and then it would associate it with a pattern, which would be the human's action or steering angle or speed. For example, when you see lane lines, you stay between them. When you see red, you stop. And when you say green, you go forward. These are patterns because they happen again and again. AI just learns them. So essentially, how this works is we start with having a car on the road. That's our input. And our output is control. So car on the road is how you get your data. And the control is what actually happens to the car. So you go from x, which is your input, to your y. Now, pretty basic, but this is actually quite substantial. And the reason for it is because this is what a traditional machine learning system looks like. So you start with your x variable, your, your input. And then there's any number of steps that the human deems necessary required to get to your desired output. The problem with this, the problem with this is that humans make a lot of mistakes. I'm not sure if you've noticed. Yeah? This is a fact. So when we decom we call this decomposing the problem. It's when you start with, so for self-driving cars, when you decompose the problem, we'll start with having a car on the road and we'll decompose it to the first step, which is teaching the car how to detect lane lines. After that, we go into path planning and then after that control. But as I showed you previously, you can use end-to-end -end learning and go from one directly to the other. So why would we allow humans to meddle? Human decomposition, hence, is unnecessary. And end-to-end -end learning is crazy. Literally, you give the system a ton of data, and it just figures out how to drive. It just figures it out just by watching other people drive, which is exactly how I think humans learn how to drive. I don't know how to drive, so I can't vouch for that myself. <laughs> so human decomposition, are there better ways? Yes, 100%, there are better ways. And this is it. This is the better way, AI regurgitation. So on a high level, this is what the system looks like. So you input your training data, which would be a visual and steering angle. So the goal of, the goal of this model in particular is to output the accurate steering angle. So your visual would be typically um, you, you have human drivers who drive around for a really long time and you collect your training data. So you'll have cameras on three locations on the car, one in the front, in the very middle, and one on the left, and one on the right. This allows to, you to gain a little bit more variation in the training data. Now, at the same time, you'll also be recording the steering angle that was inputted by the human driver. Um, in this case, we record the steering angle as 1 over r. And the reason for that is because r is the steering angle, the steering radius, sorry, in meters. Uh, but driving straight, r is equal to infinity. And because you can't have an infinite steering angle, that does not work. Afterwards, um, you put all of this data into a CNN, or a convolutional neural network. Now, what a convolutional neural network is, it's um, a neural net. So neural nets are how AI can learn to recognize different patterns, except this one in particular is really good with images. So it can learn the patterns from the images, in this case of the road. It learns what the lane lines look like and what that means for the steering angle. And it spits out a random prediction of what it thinks the steering angle should be. Now, this steering angle is compared to what the actual steering angle is, as inputted by the human driver. And then the error is calculated. 
Once the error is calculated, it is back propagated to the neural network. And what that just, me that just means that the error is fed back into the neural network so that it can adjust itself slightly and try again. And on a kind of trial and error basis, over time, it will become better at predicting the accurate steering angles. So um, I thought we should get a little bit more technical with this. And for reference, we'll be using a project that I did uh, using Udacity self-driving car simulator. So I was able to make a car drive autonomously on my computer. So the first thing we do is collect training data. And this is, I explained a little bit what it looks like, but this is pretty much what it looks like. So you can see that one frame per each frame, you will have three different images, center, left, and right, to create more variation in the training data. And you'll also collect the numerical values. So in this case, spearing, throttle, reverse, and speed. So uh, over here, you can see that all of the speed, all of the speed, numerical values are actually zero and that's sorry not speed steering and that's just because during this point in time the car was driving forward so no turning um, the steering angles would usually be uh, negative values all the way to negative one if it was a left turn and then a positive one if it was a right turn and anywhere in between for anywhere in between so one thing we do to create a little bit more variation in the data is image augmentation the reason we do this is, imagine the scenario. You train a self-driving car driving on the road. It's a bright sunny day, just like it is in my simulation. Now, what if you, ask, what if you train the car using this data, but then asked it to drive at night? Most likely, it would get confused. And the reason for this is because it's never seen that before, and it doesn't know how to deal with that. Again, AI is just pattern recognition. So if it doesn't know what the patterns would be when the screen is darker, then it doesn't know how to drive. So there are a number of things we can do to augment the image. They include flipping, zooming, darkening, brightening, and panning the images to create variations in the training data. If you were to flip the image, for example, this one is flipped, you also have to tra uh, flip the steering angle. So from negative to positive. This is super useful for one main reason, which is making sure that your data distribution is e even. For example, imagine you train your track on just one loop. It goes in one direction. The problem with this is say you're, you were driving, okay, you're driving one way, you're probably going to accumulate a large number of turns in one direction and then not the other. other. So your data distribution, imagine you had a graph where zero was straight and you had positive one as a right, driving right and the negative one as driving light, left, you may have a lot driving right and less driving left. And what that would create is bias your model is then more likely to predict driving right, even if it was driving left, or supposed to drive left. This is the batch generator, and it's very, very blessed. I love the batch generator. And the reason for this is because, imagine you take all of these, all of the images you have in your training set. The last time I did this project, I had to do it several times because, Things go wrong, usually. Um, the last time I did this project, I had 22,000 training images, so a lot. Um, but if I, were to, if I were to augment each of these images and use them in the training, I would have way too much, many images. And then that would take up a lot of memory space. And it's just a lot more for the model to handle. And it's unnecessary. Therefore, we use the batch generator. And what the batch generator does is it randomly generates a batch of augmented images every time the model needs them during the training and only when the model needs them during the training. Immediately after, it destroys all of the images. So they take up no memory space. Anyone else want to take a picture? I don't want to like uh, leave it if you still want to. Very good. Good, good. Yeah, OK. Uh, final, finally, before we move on to the actual training, we pre-process our image. That just means, uh, because this is a computer vision application, you want to, sorry, computer vision is how computers are able to understand the things that we see. Um, you want to make the images as easy as possible for the computers to understand. So part of this is pre-processing. So when I look around at all of you, I see a lot of different people, right? But I feel like it's a it would be for a computer looking at the same angle, it would be difficult. There's a lot of like different colors because computers can't see things as easily as we see. So we make it as easy as possible, and there are a couple of ways we do this. The first thing we do is crop the image. You can see that the, um, the pre-processed image is shorter. The reason for that is the background image, sorry, sorry, the background, so where the trees are, 
actually have nothing to do with the car's ability to drive. So we just crop that out because um, if it was there, the model would compute those anyway. So it's just more compu computational power without much outcome. We also um, apply a Gaussian blur um, that just reduces the image noise. So it would take away a lot of unnecessary details. For example, if you take a look at the, the pavement, the pavement in the original images, there are a lot of different spots and they're not necessarily important. So we just kind of blur those out. Then the last thing we do is we change the color scheme to a YUV color scheme. Originally we have RGB, which is red, green, blue, which means three different color channels. I'm not 100% sure what YUV stands for, but it has been proven to be way more efficient for computer vision purposes. Next, we move on to actually training. We've done ev everything we need to do with the training data and we can move on to the model. Um, so this is what the model looks like. At the bottom, we input our training data, we normalize the data and then move into the convolutions. Um, then, we then we flatten the data, which just means, say you have, if you have an image that's like a three by three pixels, you flatten it so it would just turn into a string of nine pixels. This is just um, because when you input it to a neural network, it's just a little bit easier for the network to understand. And then at the end, it would output its prediction for what the accurate steering angle is. So this is a convolution. This is my favorite GIF or GIF, whatever you prefer, on the internet. Um, the reason I love this one is because it moves like all GIFs or GIFs. But the, reason, the particular reason I love this one is because it gives a very good explanation, I think, as to what kernels are. So a convolution, what that is, is you will have a kernel. And what a kernel is, is it's, it depicts a feature of an image. And this, so the kernel goes through the original image to see how closely that part of the image matches with the feature depicted in the kernel. For example, if I were to go over, um, if I were to go over a picture of a face, um, and I had a kernel that depicted an eye-like feature, it would go through and find the strongest match where the eyes actually were. So in this situation, um, the orange square is the kernel, and you can, see on, you can see the red numbers. These are the pixel values that the kernel is looking for. Wherever it matches up in a part of the image, that part of the image accumulates a certain number of points that are then stored in the feature map, or in this case, the convolved features. So every single time you have a convolution, you will shrink the image but the computer will find it easier to understand. So it's not visual, it just converts it to pixels, pixel data, so new numbers, because that's what computers know best. If you wanted to see it in code, this is what the model looks like. Um, so you can see that we have our five convolutional layers at first, we flatten them, then we have a couple of dense layers, which are the fully connected layers towards the end. We optimize using an atom optimizer and what that just does at the bottom is calculate the loss function and then back propagates. Actually, I think that's a different step. And this is the result. So in 2016, um, NVIDIA published a research paper that basically um, kind of popularized end-to-end -end learning. Is that an NVIDIA shirt? <laughs> I can't tell. Yes? Yes. Awesome. So. What they did was they proved using that and that uh, self-driving cars can learn to drive, can fully learn to drive, can fully learn to train raw data from the car and map it directly to the accurate steering angle without any human decomposition of the problem. So now we're letting AI do things and learn things independently. And it's actually a little bit better. So when NVIDIA proposed this, they're, they, just, they thought that what end-to-end -end learning would lead to is better systems, sorry, better performance and smaller systems. Now the reason for this is, for, first of all, AI is ultimately, um, it's an optimization problem. So it tries to optimize as much as possible. So if there's no human saying that we need this certain amount of steps, the AI will try and minimize the function that it needs to, the, sorry, its task into as little steps as possible. The performance will also probably be better because again, there's no human bias picking which steps are the most necessary. The uh, model itself can differentiate which steps are truly the most important and just use those. So, end to end learning is cool. <laughs> if you want to contact me, my email's there and that's also my Instagram. I guess that's all for today. <laughs>
we have uh, time for two, three questions. So raise your hand if you have any questions. Yeah. No, I did not take the Udacity Nano degree. I learned most of this from other courses, like on Udemy. I think the majority of what I know f about self-driving cars is actually from like a $13 course on Udemy. So pretty good snatch. <laughs> hello, Zara. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, you told me about um, even distribution of data. So, uh, but y y you were talking about um, turns, so left and right. Um, I've had a question about um, going forward and going backward. So how do we um, collect the data about um, going going forward? Isn't it, uh, shouldn't it be more information about going forward um, instead of going backward? Because like car cars mainly go forward. Um, how, how does it work? So in a larger self-driving car simulation, so um, most of the screenshots uh, that I showed you, um, for example, this one, are actually from my own simulation it w in which the only prediction was the steering angle. And for that reason, the only thing that was involved in the model was the steering angle. But in a full self-driving car with a full system, um, all of these values would actually take into play. So um, sp speed and throttle would also be relevant. Speed, throttle, reverse all these things would be applied in a real self-driving car and you can, I believe it would be, you would have more than one neural networks that would predict like different things, like one for speed, one for throttle, but I'm not 100% sure on that, so don't quote me on it. <laughs> one more. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, you mentioned that you, you're taking a full end-to-end uh, -end approach, right? Uh, using a uh, um, neural net to control a car. So my question is, uh, how far do you think this approach is from the uh, practical application? Because like, my understanding is, um, in reality, a, you know, a real car running a real world, it's a lot more complicated than the simulated environment. And also neural, net, neural nets is a black box. And you have no idea how it reached to a certain decision, and that create creates a lot of um, you know problems. Okay, thank Thanks. you for your question. So, um, as for again, majority of what I showed you in this presentation was from my own um, project. But and this is Nvidia's car, and if you go on YouTube, you can watch like their whole video. They actually did use a full like totally end-to-end -end learning approach, and the car learned to drive entirely. Um, so yeah, real driving is probably a little bit more complicated, no, probably a lot more complicated than my simulation, but it is possible for sure. Uh, you'd probably need more computations and more neural nets to predict different things, like not just steering angle, obviously. Um, as for the black box, where you don't really know what's going on under the hood, I think that's a general challenge for a lot of things revolving around AI. I kind of think, like personally, I think that if our task, like if the AI that does the task that we wanted it to, I feel like that's enough. And yeah, it's kind of freaky that we don't know what's going on underneath, but ultimately I think as long as it doesn't have internet access, I don't feel like anything dangerous will happen. Thank you very much, Zara. A round cool. of applause. Thank you for having me. This is. Been